Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Leticia Cortez and this is the Stanford Healthcare Nurse Residency Program Application Preparation Webinar. Um, as you can see, we'll be recording this session. Um, we just ask that everybody please mute yourself. Um, there will be an opportunity uh, at the end of the session to have um, open question and answers. Um, we ask at that time you could unmute yourself, but until then, please keep yourself muted. So to begin for this session, um, we have some objectives that we will be covering in this webinar. So in this webinar, um, we, the participant will understand Stanford Healthcare application process and expectations for prospective applicants. Um, after this webinar, the participant will be able to describe the application requirements with a heightened understanding on cover letter and resume writing. And the participant will be able to understand Stanford Healthcare Nurse Residency Program as it relates to the cohort timelines, clinical placement and departments that are hiring, um, our nurse residency program participation and retention rates, as well as uh, the nurse residency program curriculum. So I haven't done so already, but I will introduce myself. Again, I am Leticia Cortez. I'm a nursing professional development specialist here at the nurse residency program. It's a long list of names and titles that I have there. Um, my program team includes Carrie Zoss and Christy Norris, who is joining our uh, webinar this afternoon. We are really excited to have three current nurse residents joining us uh, for our Q&A session later on. Um, we have Alejandra Alcala, Ernest Bong, and Danielle Schmid, and they will be joining and helping you and help to answer some of your questions later on. Last but not least, we have Carly Day, that is our uh, human resources partner, and she will be, she is a senior talent strategist. So she works on recruitment and processing all of your applications and does so much work, I can't even name it all, but uh, we're really happy to partner with her. Um, and she's here joining us and she will also be answering questions and she has some information of frequently asked questions that she'll be addressing um, after the program presentation. And then um, if you have any questions that you think are not covered, we ask that you wait till the end of the presentation. There's a lot of information that we'll be covering here. Um, so if you do feel like something, you want a little bit clarification or your service broke up a little bit and you wanted to hear something else, you can just chat, type in the chat and um, we can maybe answer some of those questions. But again, there will be an opportunity to have open Q&A at the end of the webinar. Okay, so just a little background of who we are. Um, at Stanford Healthcare, our nurse residency program is a nationally accredited transition to practice program through the American Nurses Credentialing Center. So if you're not familiar with the ANCC, um, they set the global standard for nurse for residency programs, I'm sorry, that transition registered nurses into new practice settings. So you being a new graduate nurse, um, they set the standard for what a residency program would be for you transitioning into acute care environment. Our program is thoughtfully designed and high for highly motivated, determined and compassionate new graduate nurses with the overarching goal um, to develop compassionate, com competent, committed clinical nurses who make a positive impact in our patients' um, lives. So part of how we meet that goal of being able to develop these competent and compassionate nurses is with our curriculum. We use Vizient's nurse residency uh, curriculum and Vizient Nurse Residency Curriculum was developed in a, uh, by the Vizient who partners with academic institution or academic medical centers. Um, and they partner with the American Association College of, Colleges of Nursing. So the residency curriculum was developed at a time of need when many new nurses were entering the profession but leaving their roles within the first year of their career. So together, Vizient and with the academic medical centers and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing uh, got together and created a residency curriculum that was uh, the goal was to support new graduate nurses uh, in the transition into their practice. So our program isn't an extension of nursing school, uh, meaning that we don't reteach nursing uh, school concepts, but we take all of your knowledge, your skills and your background experience and we build upon that. And we teach you how to use those skills and experience and apply it at the care setting when you take care of patients. So it's uh, integrated, our program integrate, integrates three principal domains of leadership, 
patient outcomes and professional role. So when we look at leadership, we're really looking at how to help you develop your decision-making skills or how to um, communicate effectively in a professional environment. How do you coordinate the care of all of these patients? This is new to you, right? How do you use your resources? How do you escalate? How do you delegate? All of those things that uh, create a good leader in the clinical environment. We show you how to pivot and leverage on all the experiences you have and apply it in that care setting. Uh, the domain of patient outcomes. Um, we always want to incorporate research-based evidence into our practice. Um, so we look at managing the patient whose condition is changing. How do you manage a patient who's deteriorating? What do we do? What resources do we have? Um, how do you integrate uh, patients and family into teaching to make it effective, to really get to those outcomes that are beneficial for them and their uh, recovery? How do you take care of a patient who's in pain? You know, when this is something new, it's a chronic pain patient and everything that we have is not working. So how do you uh, manage that and how do you get them to um, you know, meet their needs and come up with the goal that we can work on. When we look at professional role, we really uh, take an emphasis and a lot of thought into how we can help our nurse residents uh, manage stress and engage in self-care. So just like when we are learning about, um, you know, every care, care for a patient is individualized. Well, we look at self -manage, stress management and self-care the same. So for every nurse resident, um, managing stress looks different, taking care of themselves looks different. So we really take the time in our program to help our nurse residents identify what that is for them. That way they can have the tools to be able to um, take care of themselves and manage their stress if needed while they're a nurse, especially in this first year. So we also look at what it means to be a cultural competent nurse. Um, how is it to take care of maybe your first end of life patients? It's not something that you've had experience with in nursing school or there's ethical decisions being made and you really don't know how to feel. Um, we go over those things. And then ultimately when we're ending the program, we look at professional development for our nurse residents and what does the future hold for them? What do they, what do they see for themselves in the next year, two to five years? And how can we help set them on the path to achieve those goals? So that's really what our curriculum entails and how we address those things. So our program structure. So we could talk about how we do all of this work. Our program is a one-year program um, and it's structured with these four categories or sometimes we call them buckets. Um, the first category is our orientation. So our nurse residents um, engage in a orientation process that uh, has over 300 clinical hours with a trained preceptor. We like to throw in the word trained there because our uh, preceptors do volunteer to precept these nurse residents, but they go through some training prior. So some of their training will include um, how to give feedback, um, understanding learning styles, how to teach to those learning styles, and understanding the um, process of an uh, advanced beginner nurse to competent. Like, what does that look like? Where are people at in the level of learning? And how do you um, really engage that nurse resident and help them make everything click? Um, our second category includes our seminars and simulation. So we have classes um, and simulation that's facilitated by, facilitated by us, the nurse residency program faculty. Again, we're not reteaching nursing school concepts and having you know the first code blue and making pe people feel nervous, but we're really um, engaging you to support your development and teaching you how to apply all the knowledge and skills that you have and apply them at the bedside in an effective manner. Our third category includes check-in meetings. So we follow the nurse residents uh, with a supportive and collaborative check-in structure. So a member of the nurse residency program um, will collaborate with your unit leadership and follow your progress during the program. So we have frequent check-ins during your orientation and then we follow you throughout the year and we offer support and guidance when and where needed. Our fourth category is our evidence-based practice project. Um, this seems to provoke a lot of anxiety in our nurse residents. <laughs> they want to know a lot about it on day one, um, but it's at the end of the year program. Every nurse resident is required to uh, participate in this project, and it supports the development of critical thinking and 
clinical reasoning. So it's presented at the end. We match you with cohort mates, so you're not by yourself presenting. So you may have people in one unit that are together. Maybe we pair them with another unit that is of like, so neurology and neurosurgery, somewhat like units, so we put them together. And it's guided by our practice partner. So you have a clinical nurse specialist who is guiding the work and really putting the, uh, helping you structure your project. So that is what our program structure looks like with the four buckets. So over the recent years, our program has grown not only in sheer volume, but footprint in the hospital. So this chart here shows us how, or shows you, how much our program has grown in the amount of nurse residents that we're taking in. So if we just point out to fiscal year 18 and 19, we were taking 20 and 26 nurse residents for the whole year, which I can't believe that now that I'm looking back at that now. Um, and then we jump up to fiscal year 20, and we took over 100 for the first time. So we took 116 nurse residents that year. And FY21 and 22, we had just continued that growth. And the last fiscal year that just ended in uh, end of August, we took 200 nurse residents. So we're really, um, you know, happy to be able to bring in more nurse residents and really keep the program going and um, being effective. Um, but also what we're proud of is, you know, all the growth is impressive, but growth without retention of our nurse residents isn't our goal. So as much as we recruit these awesome and motivated nurse residents, we really want to keep them and grow them within Stanford's um, organization. So we're happy to show that since 2018, we've been able to maintain a retention rate of over 90%, which is awesome because we love we all the nurse residents we bring in I like every cohort I am more and more impressed with the nurse residents we bring in and the fact that our retention rate um, is holding and meaning that we get to keep these nurse residents within our system is really uh, really makes me happy to know that we're providing this great care to our patients okay so this is a listing of the hiring units and departments. We don't have a finalized list of the departments that are taking nurse residents into uh, cohort 38, but this is an example of areas that have taken um, nurse residents in the past few cohorts. So like we mentioned before, we are growing in different um, in volume and areas. So previously critical care um, didn't take nurse residents. Um, so a few years back, they began to take critical uh, nurse residents into the critical care area and it was really successful. So um, areas that do take it, this is just an example, only a few, uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery. We have general surgery, trauma and surgical transplant that take nurse residents um, for the critical care area. We have a surgical and medicine AAU. So that's something that's unique to Stanford. It's a QED adaptable unit. So I know in other hospitals or other systems, you might just hear a med surge department or med surge intermediate care, um, med just acute care. Hi, can you mute yourself? Thank you. Okay, so here at Stanford, it's a specialty hospital. So we care for our patients. Um, based on the specialty. So we have areas of surgical care. So it might include hepatobiliary, minimally invasive surgery, cardiac surgery, or trauma. And then we also have our medicine specialties that include cardiology, pulmonary hypertension. We have a neurology and our advanced lung disease area. So we care for those patients in the specialty. But what's unique to Stanford is with the acuity adaptable unit, we're able to care for patients from intermediate care to acute care. Meaning if a patient needs a closer eye to be watched or looked over or needs telemetry, they stay in that specialty unit, even if they are um, a higher level of care or an a, a acute level of care. So we're really happy to be able to provide that care where the nurses are specialized to take care of those patients um, without leaving. So that's something that you will see. So surgical AAU is a surgical acuity adaptable unit. Medicine is a medical uh, acuity adaptable unit. We take nurse residents into the oncology department. Um, that includes BMT, so bone marrow transplant, hematology, medical oncology also takes patients. Uh, the adult emergency department has taken now two cohorts of nurse residents, uh, as, as well as their clinical decisions unit. Inpatient float pool um, takes patient takes nurse residents um, into the program. So inpatient float pool serves the surgical, medicine, and oncology areas. It does not um, take nurse residents into the critical care float pool. But as a float pool nurse, you will be trained uh, to take care of patients in either of the areas of surgical, medicine, or oncology. 
um, and you flow it out to where the needs are in the hospital. And patient psychiatry cares for patients um, in the psychiatry department, either voluntary or involuntary. So you're trained. It sounds like it's two separate units, but you're trained to take care of patients in both areas. Clinical trials, we do receive a lot of questions on our clinical trials area of like, what do they do? Are they in a lab? Are they behind a computer? Do they take care of patients? So yes, it is a patient facing direct patient care position. So you care for patients who are admitted to the hospital that are undergoing uh, clinical trials in um, a specialty area. So if that specialty area is not conducting research, so we can give an example of a patient who is admitted um, as a trauma patient and they're currently under a clinical trial taking a, a test drug for a um, diagnosis that they have, we will have a clinical trials nurse go um, and take care of the patient in that area. The reason why that's really important is because clinical trials have a lot of details and um, guidelines that are really important to the validity of the study that's going on. So we want to make sure that these nurses um, who are taking care of the patients have that special training and background and understand and have familiarity with that so that they can still provide care for the patient and um, that the study uh, continues with that patient. And so here at Stanford, there's a lot of studies going on and um, clinical trials. So there are times when there are not. So when the shift is occurring and a nurse resident goes to work and there's no clinical trials currently happening, um, the department works collaboratively with the float pool and then they end up um, serving as a supplemental float pool. So they'll go and be dispatched into the medical, surgical, or oncology areas to take care of patients who are not undergoing clinical trials. Perianesthesia has taken uh, nurse residents into the program. Uh, it's under perianesthesia, but again, similar to psych psychiatry. Uh, they take patient, they take nurse residents into the, they train them in pre-op and PACU, um, and they care for patients in either or, so they're be able to care for both areas. Uh, so when the application opens, you'll have an opportunity to see which uh, departments are taking nurse residents. This is a timeline of our uh, cohort 38, which the application period will be opening on October 31st. Um, so we like to give this little timeline to show you all that happens from the time of application opening to the start date of the cohort. So you will be able to fill out an application for a clinical nurse one position beginning um, October 31st. Uh, we are aiming to take about 100 nurse residents into the cohort. Um, there will be one link or one posting for the positions. We won't post 100 uh, postings for different areas. Within the application, you'll be able to select areas that you're interested in, and we'll go over that a little bit later. But you will fill out one link for um, the application. It's a one clinical nurse, one position. The application period will be open for two weeks. After the two-week period, uh, we take a week to look through all the applications, uh, making sure there's no duplicates or things that were still pending that, you know, failed in the uploading um, process. Uh, so we take a week to clean up the applications. Um, and then after that week, we start our screening. So our team, as well as our department here at the Center for Education and Professional Develop, we all pull together and we screen all the applications. What that means is we look at everything that's submitted and we'll go over all those documents shortly. Uh, but we really look through everything and making sure that um, all the documents are there required and that they meet all the qualifications. So this is just a long period from the time that it's open to the end of the year, we are still processing all these applications. So keep that in mind. Uh, we do get a lot of inquiry of where their progress, where their process or where the progress of their application is. Um, and at this point till the end of the year, it's still in the screening process. Uh, there's too many applications to actually put in a status for each one. So we wait until everything is screened. And then when we come back from the holiday, um, the beginning of the new year, uh, we start to plan for our interview panels. So we take about three weeks to uh, organize all the applications in order of scores. We fill in the interview panels, um, and then you'll start to get contacted in the end of that three-week preparation uh, for the interview panel timeline, which begins January 23rd to February 3rd. So that first week of interview panel interviews um, is panel interviews. So it'll be a panel of applicants with a panel of managers on the line and they uh, have an interview process. 
if in that process a manager feels that you're a fit for their unit, they'll invite you back the following week for a unit level interview. In that unit level interview, uh, it's a smaller audience, I'll say, um, and they really take the time to interview a, like a second interview. On February 3rd, 2 3, um, final offers go out to the human resources department, so to Carly's team, um, and then they start to work on offering. Um, the positions out and getting everybody cleared for the start date of 320. Something that is um, new to our program that we are implementing this cohort is a cutoff date for our California nurse residents California license. So we have a cutoff date of 227.23 to have your California license in hand. Um, what's happened previously is we've had um, people have be ready to start or be cleared through the process and they uh, didn't obtain their license. And so we um, were able, weren't able to fill the position in time to get somebody to start on 320. And we could talk about this a little bit um, more when we get to the slides that have that information. But again, our start date for the cohort that is applying 1031 is going to start 320-23. So that's the start date of this cohort uh, application period. Okay, so since most of you are here, I'm sure you're all um, interested in application process for the nurse residency program. And I'm sure most of you have three of these requirements already checked off. So in order to apply for our program, you must be a graduate from an accredited nursing program. So we do accept associate's degree nurses, uh, bachelor's degree and master's prepared nurses. We do accept accredited online programs as well. To be able to apply, you uh, can have no more than six months full-time experience as a registered nurse. So if you've worked 40 hours a week for the consistently last six months, that wouldn't make you, that will make you ineligible to apply to the program. Now, if you're working part-time and you're working less than six months, you can add up the hours um, as long as you're less than the 40 hours per week times six months, um, you can still apply. There are instances where people have worked longer than six months and because they're part-time, they're still under that um, uh, exclusion criteria. So just make sure you um, calculate those hours and that you don't exceed the six months in hours. The time is subject to whether you're full-time or part-time. Your official graduation date uh, on your transcripts can be no greater than 18 months from the cohort start date. So we listed the cohort start date of 320 of 23. I marched it back 18 months and it's 920 of 21 um, that you cannot, your transcript dates cannot be greater than that. And then part of your application requirement is you are to submit all required application documentation. So you might be interested in what this application documentation is and we're going to break that down a little bit more in this next few slides. So the required documentation includes transcripts. So you can um, include official or unofficial. So you still might be in school, so your transcripts will be unofficial um, and you may have a hard time getting those official transcripts. So we do accept unofficial, I mean, I'm sorry, official. Um, again, just making sure you pay attention to that date that it does not go back 18 months than the um, cohort start date. We ask for a cover letter. We'll go over what that entails in the next few slides. Um, resume. So in that resume, we have um, items listed here that should be addressed, including education, a list of your rotation, references, work experience, nursing and intern experience, I'm sorry, intern and extern experience, military experience, volunteer experience, a completion of electronic application that includes your application questions. I want you to see the areas that have um, underlined and bolded. Uh, those are areas on the application that can accumulate a score for you. So not that it's more important than the education. All the items here listed on the resume, we ask that you include them. Um, but the, where we look at specifically to give you a score would be ex work experience. We give a score for any work experience. Nursing um, intern or externship is not related to clinical rotation. So it's not a capstone. It's not part of your... Um, school curriculum, we give a score for that. 
you just need to make sure that you include all of the information. So the agency, the supervisor, what your role was and the time frame and responsibilities while you were there. Military experience, again, listing that job role, the title and uh, responsibilities, including what branch of the military as well. If you have volunteer experience, again, you list that general information so it could be tracked. What's specific to volunteer experience is their score is based on hours volunteered. So if you have you know, have been volunteering for a short amount of time, it might be a little easier to track that information. If you've been volunteering for a long amount of time or you've been volunteering for a few years, give your best estimate and again, provide the information of who to contact at that agency um, and list it there. When you complete the electronic application, there'll be an area to answer questions. Uh, answers for those questions will be scored on a does not meet, a meet or exceeds expectations. And we will also be going over those questions and examples in the next few slides. A recommendation, um, when I talk about references, I'm sorry, we'll go over in the next few slides. Um, a minimum of two references from nursing school faculty. So not a preceptor, not a theory instructor, it has to be, uh, I'm sorry, nursing faculty, but we want it to be somebody from the clinical environment that observed your practice. So yeah, again, not uh, somebody who did theory, we want somebody who could speak to your clinical performance. We recommend that you have everything in one PDF uh, Word document to prevent error. There's, we love our technology, but sometimes there are glitches and we find that when there's a lot of documents being uploaded is a lot of room for error. So if you're able to put all of this um, in one PDF or Word document and upload it, um, that would be really beneficial to you. It's our recommendation. Okay, so let's go over a cover letter. So if you're not familiar with the cover letter, maybe this is, you've never had to fill out a cover letter for a job. This is your first professional environment. Um, a cover letter really just gives insight to your soft skills, attitudes, and motivation. It introduces you to an employer through a personalized explanation of qualifications, your interests, and your interest in a position. So employers use these cover letters to get a sense of who you are um, and how you would use your experiences to accomplish the requirements of a position. So the requirements of a new graduate nurse, how are you going to use all of that experience that you're coming in with um, to really perform in your position as a new nurse? So these are just some suggestions or from things that we've seen before. So you may choose to share some of the following in a cover letter. So you may choose to share why you chose nursing and what motivated you to choose this profession. So you might wanna say, you know, you had an experience when you were younger and it was always your um, motivation to become a nurse or um, maybe this was something that you tripped upon, you know, just share that experience of what really put you to um, get to this point. Um, you can share what you have done or what you've overcome to get to this point in your nursing career. You know, everybody has a unique story and a unique um, uh, journey to this profession. So that's something that you can share in your cover letter. Again, all of this is kind of coming at, you can share what makes you uniquely qualified for this role. So you can, again, use all of your experiences, your clinical rotation, maybe your educational training, your work experience, volunteer or your military experience, um, and really highlight how that makes you qualified or sets you apart from other people or other applicants um, and really uh, makes you a, a good fit for this organization. And you could share just that. Why did you choose Stanford? Um, what are you looking for in an organization and how, what can you offer to an organization and how your values are aligned with Stanford's? So that's something you can share as well. You could also share your future plans. So what do you plan to accomplish in the future? Um, so you can let your resume speak for your past experiences, which is our next slide we'll go over, and you can use this cover letter to speak to where you want to go. The main purpose um, is to have this cover letter support the content of your resume. So your resume is going to focus on like black and white facts, what have you done, um, and your cover letter is really going to expand on that um, and showcase those achievements or really um, showcase your personality and explains why you'd be a good fit for the company. Um, so, you know, you can get creative with the cover letter or you can keep it um, to just a certain basic information, but you just really want to highlight and show um, a little bit more of who you are and your experiences and relate that to the position that you're applying for. So your resume, um, so your resume shares the technical details of your skills and your work experience. 
It provides a summary, summary of your experiences, your abilities, your strengths, skills, and accomplishments. Um, it states relevant information regarding your education, experience, and job-related interests. It demonstrates what you've done in the past, which should align with what your job you're seeking. Now, just to detail into that a little bit, any job that you've had, you can always use um, that to relate it to the job that you're seeking. It doesn't have to be a healthcare related position. You could have a customer service position. You could have been in a management position. You could have been um, in food service. All of those things, there are um, skills and um, experience that you can use to relate to a job as a, a profession as a career as a nurse. So your resume is your personal marketing tool that allows you to effectively and clearly communicate your assets to a potential employer. So in your resume, like I said, we're listing here the items that we want to see on your resume. Um, the bolded and underlined areas are the areas that can accumulate a score, but we still want everything included on your resume. So beginning with education, you include your nursing education degree, the school date and program completion, school and date of program completion. Um, you can include non-nursing degrees as well if that's applicable to you. Clinical rotations, we'd like to see the nursing curriculum associated with each rotation, um, the location of each rotation, and the number of hours. So your example could be, you could just put in a basic listing or you could put it in a chart. It would be nursing one, two, three, would, would be advanced med surge, located at Stanford Healthcare, and the spring semester of 22, and you had 200 hours, something like that. And you just have a running tally of all your rotations. You want to include work and military or and or military experience. In those categories, you include your title uh, or your role, who the employer was, the time that you were there, and your roles and responsibilities. Again, really, you could just list a general listing, or you can try to tie it into um, what would be pertinent to the role as a nurse. Volunteer experience, uh, you want to include your title or your role, who would you contact, um, how many hours you volunteered, and roles and responsibilities. Remember, if you don't include the hours of volunteered um, service, that can reach a score. We can't score that without the numbers of um, volunteered hours. Nursing intern or externship, that's not associated with the clinical rotation. Paid or unpaid is what, um, as long as it's an externship, internship, you include your title role, the agency and the supervisor, the time you were there and your roles and responsibilities. References. So we look for a minimum of two references from nursing uh, school of nursing faculty. We do not require, we did require uh, letters of recommendation before, but there's a lot of difficulty in getting um, clinical instructors to write those letters. So now we are just asking uh, for names and contact information. So you still wanna reach out to these um, instructors to get their blessing to use their name. Um, if they are called, you don't want them to be unexpecting of that reference. So this is your, the things that you can, you should include on your resume. Again, paying attention to the areas that are scored on an application. We give score for any work experience. Volunteer experience is based on the hours. Nursing intern or ex externship is paid or unpaid, but as long as it's not associated with clinical rotation and your references should be clinical instructors, but you make sure that you contact them and they know that you'll be listing them as a reference. We want our clinical rotations to have the nursing curriculum associated, the location of each rotation and the number of hours and include all, um, you can include for sure your nursing education, but you want to include your non-nursing degrees, you can as well. So your resume is really just an advertisement for you um, and just highlighting all your unique skills and qualifications and benefits that you have to offer. So now we get to the electronic application portion of your application. So when you enter in that link for the clinical nurse one, you'll be asked to just initially answer some demographic information and general application questions. So it's like yes and no answers. How did you hear about this position? Will you be willing to commit to a one-year program? And then you'll be given the option to rank your specialty um, in order of preferred work setting. So the settings will be listed. And if you're really passionate and want to work in clinical trials, that'll be your first um, option. And then second would be oncology. And third, maybe you're interested in medicine. That would be the ranking that you would give all the way down to the end. 
electronic application questions. You're gonna be required to answer four questions. Um, each has multiple components and we're gonna go over that. And this is also an area that you can accumulate points or accumulate a score for your answers. The length of answers is up to the applicant. We accept all answers regardless of the length. So here are the questions. Full transparency, these are the questions that will be on the application. Um, we're gonna read through them. You could take a picture of this or you could refer back to this recording when it's posted. So tell us about a time during your clinical rotation when you experienced a caring moment with a patient. How did this moment affect the patient's outcome and how has it changed your clinical practice? Second question, tell us about a time you had an error in judgment. It can be personally, professionally, or academically. What happened? What did you learn from this experience? How has this experience shaped you into the nursing profession that you are today? Third question, tell us about a time you provided service to a community. What type of service did you provide? So examples would be you assisted a neighbor in need, volunteered at a homeless shelter, coached a youth sports team, how has serving a community prepared you for a profession that is committed to compassionate service? Last question. So the success, successful completion of a nursing program requires hard work, persistence, dedication, and resilience. Share with us what initially motivated you to pursue a career in nursing. What goals did you set for yourself? What obstacles did you have to overcome to achieve these goals? So these are the questions that will be on the application. If you notice, they all have three prompts, and we're gonna um, take that first question and really go over it um, in detail of how we can help you answer these questions on your application. So there's three parts to each question. First part is we want you to tell us a story. Second part is uh, telling us how did it affect the patient's outcome? And the third, how has it changed your clinical practice? And what we really highlight here is the third part of how it changed your clinical practice. Um, this is where the meat of the answer will be. This is where your score will actually be given um, based on if you met the expectation, didn't meet the expectation or exceeded the expectation. We don't score your stories. So your story is your story, what you choose to share. What we really wanna emphasize is what did you learn from this? How did you move on from this? What are you integrating from this story into your practice? Um, now, so using this example, tell us about a time during your clinical rotation when you experienced a caring moment with a patient. How did this patient, how did this moment affect the patient's outcome and how has it changed your clinical practice? So the first part, tell uh, a time when you had a caring moment with a patient. So you can use the example of you sat with a concerned family member or you stayed with a patient and offered comfort. So that's your story. Okay, that part is included. Part two, how did this moment affect the patient's outcome? So the patient felt, you can include the patient, uh, the family member felt relieved and calm, or the patient felt supported and comforted and verbalized that the procedure was much easier knowing I was there. And part three, how has it changed your clinical practice? So when you're answering these questions, these prompts, you really want to focus on this last part and take the time to expand on these because this is what's really going to show us or give us insight to who you are and how you're going to um, be as a bedside nurse. So what did you learn from this interaction? Um, how do you do things differently now? Is compassionate care now a proactive part of your practice rather than reactive? Um, what did this moment teach you about the human to human connection? How has your viewpoint shifted? Um, or how do you now incorporate family as an essential part of the team? So these are all questions that you can ask yourself and go through. And when you're answering this question, you can expand on these areas. Like I said, each question has three parts. We don't score the story. We do score the third part of how has it changed your clinical practice? What do you now learn? What was your reflection? Um, but if you don't answer each part, you can't, your question cannot be scored. So we're gonna give you some examples of what that's gonna look like. So again, same application question. The first response we'll share is during my labor and delivery rotation, I had the opportunity to work with a Mandarin speaking patient. I did not speak Mandarin and therefore used the interpreter services provided by the hospital to communicate with this patient. When the interpreter was not present, the patient became anxious as she did not understand what was being said around her. I approached her and grasped her hand looking her in the eyes and partnering with her in doing some slow 
brief breaths. The moment I held her hand, she smiled and appeared more calm, relaxed, and more relaxed than I had ever seen her before. I stayed with her for a, the remainder of my shift, offering my physical presence and support. When the interpreter returned, the patient thanked me and told me I was of much comfort to her. So here is the first response. We answered a story. They told us about the patient. How did it affect the patient's outcome? The patient um, thanked the nurse and told them they were much comfort, but it didn't share how uh, it changed the person's clinical practice. So this uh, was missing the third component. So it did not meet the expectations and it would not receive a score. The second answer, um, we'll read it here. During one of my early clinical rotations, I took care of a patient with a poor cancer drug prognosis. After hearing her prognosis from her doctor, she was visibly saddened. I had never cared for a patient with poor prognosis, so I felt like I was lacking the appropriate skills to adequately comfort this patient. I decided to stay with the patient and offered to hold her hand. She asked me questions about nursing, where I was from, my passions, and I freely shared the information. I found that sharing a bit about who I was allowed us to connect on a personal about personal similarities. We spoke of our love of animals and even laughed about stories of our dogs and all the trouble they got into. This interaction served as much needed distraction for the patient and she visibly was visibly more cheerful after I left. I learned that sometimes your presence is all a patient needs and now I can make a strong effort to offer my physical presence even if it's just a smile or a wave with all patient interactions. So this response told us about the caring moment, how it affected the patient, and then they shared how it changed their clinical practice. And in this response, it would be scored as it met expectations. This example is an example that has exceeded expectations. So during my senior preceptorship, I was caring for a post-lung transplant patient who had a very complicated surgical and hospital course. The patient had a trach that was not able to speak audibly. Despite many attempts, with the speaking valve, it was apparent the patient could not tolerate the speaking valve and therefore relied on writing on a whiteboard to communicate with his care providers. I had the opportunity to care for this patient multiple times and always found him extremely cooperative and motivated in his care. One shift, I noticed he was more withdrawn and less engaged with his plan of care. I inquired if everything was okay and he wrote, I am feeling frustrated. He continued to write that he met his wife on the 4th of October, 1968, and since then he has brought his wife flowers on the fourth day of every month. He knew that tomorrow, October 4th, he would not be able to continue that tradition. In that moment, I came up with a plan. I told him I would bring flowers tomorrow so that he can give them to his wife when she arrived. I gave him a blank piece of paper and some colored pens and asked him if he would, if he wanted to write a handwritten card. He immediately smiled and wrote, you bet I do. His whole face lit up. The next day when his wife came to visit, she pre he presented her with the flowers and card and she immediately burst into tears, happy tears and grateful tears. The patient was genuinely happy and expressed gratitude for the thoughtful gesture. He said it made him feel seen and cared for and helped him re recommit to his recovery. So this caring experience taught me the power of small acts of kindness, the importance of taking the time to recognize your patients beyond their disease process and how important it is to care for the whole person so they can show up fully for their own recovery. Since this moment, I have committed myself to seeing the human spirit in each patient and in doing so have embraced each patient as the unique individuals they are. I connect with each patient, ensuring that I call them by their preferred name. I proactively involve them in their care, sharing with them the goals that the care team has for them, but also ensuring that we acknowledge the patient's personal goals as well. I respect their preferences and validate their concerns. I make no assumptions. Above all, I foster a relationship built on trust, kindness, and genuine care for my patients with the hope that they know I am here to care for them as people, not just as patients. So this response did answer the question. It told us the story. It told us the outcome, and it really emphasized on how it changed this person's clinical practice. So this is what uh, exceeding expectation would look like. Again, it doesn't have to be 12 pages long to meet or exceed expectations, but you really need to emphasize on that last part of how it affected you, what has changed. Okay, so we have some general frequently asked questions about the last three slides or areas that we went over, cover letter, resume, and some general questions, and then we're gonna wrap up and get into our Q&A session. So is a cover letter required? Yes. How long should it be? It could be one 
or two pages, however long uh, you feel that it would um, meet the need, meet the goal of what you want to cover in your cover letter. How should I format my cover letter? You can use a basic Word document or whatever um, format you have, or you can have a you can subscribe to some that are a little bit fancier. Who should I address my cover letter to? To whom it may concern? You could put Stanford Healthcare Nurse Residency Program. Does Stanford read each cover letter or do they use a software application? We do not use a software application. We are not that high tech. What we have is our department and all of our colleagues here that we really take the time and look at every single resume, cover letter, application, uh, look at those transcripts and we look at the um, answers to the questions as well. Should my cover letter target a specific position specialty, the area that I'm interested in? Yes, if you are really interested in clinical trials or oncology, definitely include that and use that as your topic for your cover letter. That would be something that um, you could really emphasize why you would be a fit for that area. Should I share my work experiences even if they are not healthcare related? Most definitely, and I think we touched on that in those areas, even with the resume. Um, any job or experience that you have, again, makes you uniquely you. You could really relate it. I know a lot of my um, nursing school classmates or um, coworkers were waitress, wait staff, and that a lot of the skills that they used as wait staff, they used as nurses and really made them impressive, um, some of the things they can do. So you could definitely share those experiences. Um, should I share my senior preceptorship experience, even if it was not in adult medicine? Most definitely. Just because you're not taking care of adults doesn't mean the um, experiences that you had were not applicable to take care of adults, family members, uh, working with um, providers or your colleagues. Should I share why I think I would be an asset to your organization or does this come off as bragging? Yes, definitely share. It does not come off as bragging. Remember, this is your marketing tool. This is how you're going to show yourself and put, set yourself out um, across above others. So you really wanna use this opportunity to highlight um, why you would be an asset. For resume, is a resume required? Yes. How long should it be? However long it takes to cover the information that we ask for. How should I format it? Um, you could use a basic, simple Word document, or you can subscribe to some of these really beautiful resume writing <laughs> services, but we take any resume as long as it includes all of the information in a legible format. How should I format the clinical rotation information, chart, a list, um, anything of that, as long as it's clear and we can relate the items all together. So the clinical curric the curriculum, the location, the hours, and then the um, the time. Uh, what do I put my put if I'm still completing my clinical hours? You could put in progress, or you could put as of the date on there. You could put there, and then still in progress. Do you give extra points for attending a certain nursing school, GPA, or degree? Um, you could definitely include that. That would be something that would make you stand out. But we don't give extra points for that. Do you give extra points for clinical health, clinical at Stanford Healthcare? No, we don't. Um, should I list non-healthcare related work? Yes, definitely. And especially if you can relate it to this job. Is all volunteer work accepted? Yes. Um, I would say more recent. So if you volunteered in high school and you're 15 years out of high school, I would rethink. I would try to include something that's a little bit more recent. Um, what is considered an intern or externship? So it would be something that you were either paid or unpaid for and you served on a role under a nurse. So we want to make sure that it's... Um, related to this position. I know that some people are second careers. So we wanna make sure that the intern and externship um, is within this timeline and that it's serving in this, uh, related to this role. Should provide my RN license information. Um, you can, it's not required, but you can, in, you can include it, but you don't have to. Um, should I include my BLS or ACLS? You don't have to. Um, if you choose to put that there, you don't have to, but again, what it's just making sure you meet all the things that we're asking for. Should I list other elements on my resume, skills, certifications, and accomplishments? Yes, you can. Um, general, can I apply before I graduate? Yes, you can. Um, remember though, we do have that cutoff date. So we wanna be mindful that um, you can apply, but you wanna make sure that your dates will line up to have your California license by the given date. Can I apply before I have my RN license? Yes, you can. Uh, when do I need to have my RN license by? You need to have your California RN license by 223. Uh, can I choose my specialty area to work in? You can have an option to rank them. Um, again, we try to place people in their order of ranking. They're 
first or second choice, but it all depends on those scores. So like I said, you really wanna make sure you're covering all these areas um, and answering those questions in as detail as you can to make sure that you get um, scored for exceeding that expectation. How many people are you hiring? We aim to hire a hundred. Um, if I applied before and was not selected, can I apply again? Yes. Interview process, for, again, it's panel interviews. You'll have a large panel interview the first week. And if you're fit for that unit, you'll come back um, and you will have a unit level interview. Okay, so important application reminders. So we have an application checklist. So again, our recommendation is you try to put all of this um, required documentation in one file, PDF or Word. Um, you want transcripts, official or unofficial. You wanna include a cover letter, a resume that includes all these listed items here. Paying special attention to the experience category is where you can get some points on your resume. Completion of electronic application, making sure that you answer all four questions. Don't leave any blank. Um, you do not need to submit the following. You do not need to submit your license, ACLS, BLS, additional certifications or letters of recommendation. Again, I just, I did emphasize trying to limit the amount of uploads, put everything in one document. That way you could have we'll decrease your room for computer glitches. So if anything is not required, I wouldn't recommend to submit it. You could definitely list it on your resume if you choose to, but I wouldn't, we don't recommend you submit them if it's not required. Apply one time. So if you're concerned that there was an error occurring or occurred during your application process, please email newgradrn at stanfordhealthcare.org and state what the error is and they will respond with the next steps. So be mindful, which goes into the next point. Be mindful of this application window. Don't wait till the last minute to apply. We don't accept late applications. If there's an error, you wanna give yourself time to reach out, tell us what happened, and then wait to respond. There might be some things on the back end that we can do if there was an issue or let you know it's okay, but we definitely need some time. There's a lot of people applying and our, our bandwidth is only so big. So again, do not wait till the last minute to apply. We don't accept late applications. Please use one identifier that remains consistent on all documentation. So your resume, transcript, and application information. I'll use myself as an example. Uh, my name is Leticia Cortez. Um, for short, I go by Leti. So sometimes what we have is on our official documentation, it'll list Leticia and then everything that I created, my resume and cover letter, um, my red letters, my, yeah, my resume and cover letters will have the name Leti, my short or my nickname. So you want to make sure everything's consistent. That way, if there's any mix-ups or we just want to make sure that we are receiving the information for the intended. So I would recommend whatever is on your transcripts and the official documents, you continue that throughout. Answer all four application questions. Again, um, don't leave any blank. Uh, you wanna answer all three components of the questions. Okay, so now we have some uh, information from Carly. If she'd like to um, go over these few slides with information that she has. Thanks, Letty. Thank you. Um, I, I saw a couple of these questions popping up in the chat, so I apologize if I didn't answer them right away because I knew we were going to be getting to them. Um, for this position, it is a paid, fully benefited position. This is not a program that you have to pay to be a part of. We pay you to be a nurse for us. So you will start off as a clinical nurse one making $76.27 an hour. That is your base rate. A lot of our positions are rotating or nights, so you will get those shift differentials. Night shift is 18%, evening shift is 10%, weekend shift is 5%. And for all of those that are on the call that are out of the Palo, outside of the Palo Alto area, if you are 150 miles outside of Palo Alto, so Los Angeles, San Diego, um, Fresno, any of those areas, and then anywhere outside the state of California, we do offer $5,000 for relocation assistance. And um, that is paid out on your second paycheck with us. And um, I'm sorry, my dog is apparently having a heart attack today. Um, we also have a couple of different opportunities um, to help you find rental assistance here in the state of California. We have a group that works with me called the Center of Expertise, and we work on um, helping you guys find apartments in the area. And I know last cohort, um, someone started a Facebook group that helps you find other people that were relocating to find a place to live. 
So definitely have those options. Um, starting on your first day of work with us, you will get your PTO starts accruing. You get up to 36 days in your first year, and that's including your holidays. And um, we also offer your medical dental vision starting that first day. And, uh, as long, and also some of our extended benefits, such as long-term disability, short-term disability, um, our adoption assistance. Um, we also offer tuition reimbursement. You are eligible for up to $2,000 going towards continuing education each year, or as being part of our um, clinical nurse team, you can put that 2,000 towards the repayment of your student loans from nursing school. Um, Oh yeah, there it all is. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny. Um, and then the biggest thing that I want to stress, um, I again saw some of these questions coming in. You must have your NCLEX scheduled by February 27th. That isn't, well, I, I made sure to schedule, but it's March 6th. No, if your NCLEX date is after February 27th, you will not be eligible for this cohort. Uh, it has just been taking so much time right now between the pandemic and the influx of candidates coming to California that licensing processing times can be as quick as 48 hours up to six weeks. So we just wanna make sure that we give some adequate time to make sure that you pass all of our pre onboarding requirements. For those of you that are coming from outside of the state of California, I highly recommend taking your NCLEX in your home state, getting your home state license. And then once you have that license, applying for the temp and perm California license. The temporary license generally takes maybe one to two weeks to get, whereas sometimes the permit one can be just as quick or it could be a month or two out. So highly recommend just doing both of those. Uh, and I think that's all I have, but I will be back in the chat while Letty presents our Q&A. Thank you, Carly. Okay, so now it is time for our Q&A session. So like I said, we're always really excited to bring our current nurse residents on uh, for them to share their experience of how they prepared and actually their experience in the program. So we're gonna first have them introduce themselves um, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So um, I'm going to stop my share and I'll start with Alejandra. Can you um, introduce yourself, your specialty area, your cohort, and um, how you prepared yourself for the application process and maybe something on what made you successful in your application and interview? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandra. I currently work in K5, which is the hepatobiliary minimally invasive surgical oncology units. Um, I graduated with an ADN, and so this is the second career for me. So that whole application process was very nerve wracking for me because, you know, it was like a whole like career move. Um, I like had come from like an ADN program. It was the first time that Stanford was accepting ADN students. So I just felt like there was a lot of competition. So the best thing I did was just, you know, attend all the all the meetings that Stanford offered. You know, they offer like this meeting, they, then later on, they also offer one for like interview preparation. So all those were just, you know, had a lot of invaluable information for me. I, I applied to a lot of new grad programs, but what made Stanford's like application process different was those four essay questions. Every other program, you know, just, you know, list your resume, your cover letter, but Stanford really gave me the opportunity to really like write about like specific nursing experience and so here they give you they gave you the four questions and so what I did after the webinar is you know I started brainstorming I started thinking back to like my clinical experiences like uh what were time what were stories that or stories of like patients patient encounters that I could use for those questions and I really tried to you know really focus on like the three parts and really spent that emphasis on the last part because it's that you know, so what, you know, like, so like, why is that experience so important? And so that's something that you can take with you, um, even for like the interview process, because they're styled in a way that's like a behavioral type questions. And so for the interview, you'll be asked questions like, you know, tell me about a time when, you know, you had a conflict, tell me about a time when you had a caring moment with a patient. And so they're styled very like similarly. And so I like really broke down my answer, you know, like, I didn't stress too much about the story, you know, in the beginning, um, you know, you, everybody wants to have that story like, oh, you know, my patient was coding and I was there. I was the first one on the scene. I started CPR. You know, your stories don't have to be, you know, that like amazing. And you know, they can be as simple as holding your patient's hand, you know, like just, you know, it's the meaning that you bring to it. And so I think 
if you can really focus on the, so how did that really impact your nursing um, uh, moving forward? Like, if you really focus on that, like you'll be successful. And so I, you know, the minute the application became available, I think it's available for like a week and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Like the first day it was available, you know, I went through the instructions. I looked at what I needed to prepare and I just, you know, set myself up for success. You know, do I have all my, you know, resumes, cover letters, recommendation letters? Do I have everything in place? And then I started working on those essay questions. You know, the worst thing you can do is wait till last minute and then realize you're missing something or realize that, you know, you could have spent a little more time. And so just, you know, set yourself up for success, a success and then just, you know, work on it. You know, if, you know, one day you're having an off day, you know, set it aside, go do something else and then come back to it the next day. But, you know, you really want to, you know, you know, make yourself, you know, set yourself up for success and then just, you know, highlight all your, your good qualities. You know, I came from like, a different background, you know, I was a tax repair. So I was like, what does that have to do with nursing? But, you know, you can take little skills from your previous jobs and apply them to nursing, you know, people skills, customer skills. Are you a good communicator? Are you good with attention to detail? Um, good conflict raising? You know, think of like the skills that, uh, qualities that a good nurse would have and then focus on those, you know. You know, think of like leadership experiences you had during nursing school. Think of mentoring positions, uh, times you worked, you know, well on a team, you know, times that you took feedback, you know, like, where did you like accept feedback, you know, in a, uh, a nice manner or were you getting defensive, you know, think of like the qualities that Stanford is looking for and like highlight those. And so I think, you know, if you just brainstorm, um, yeah, and just set yourself up for success. Thank you, Alejandra. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ernest, can we have you introduce yourself, uh, list what your specialty area is, um, where you were at in the cohort, and then again, like how you prepared yourself for the application process and what made you successful in it? Yeah, of course. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ernest. I'm uh, in cohort 36. Uh, I'm currently on M7. It's a cardiovascular surgical unit. Um, and then in regards to prepping for the interview process and the application process, um, I would say a big part was uh, for at least my program, we had to do reflections every week. And so a lot of those reflections were based off of uh, clinical experiences. And so, um, you know, all of them were submitted electronically. So I was able to go back through all my reflections and kind of highlight certain uh, clinical experiences that I had. And so I was able to use those for um, the application process as well as for the interview. And so I was able to kind of look back at those reflections and see um, if any of those qualities kind of applied to the application process, some of the questions. Um, I know I'm kind of being a dead horse and Letty talked about it a lot, but it, the, uh, the last part of the, um, the questions, the uh, how it changed your practice, I think that's a, a huge, uh, kind of component that I think oftentimes might have gone overlooked. And so I know for myself, I literally uh, wrote out, this is how it changed my, you know, my practice. Um, and then in regards to the application process, the questions that you do there, and then later on for the interview, um, I was going to say is um, uh, looking back at previous videos. So like there's a YouTube channel that has um, all the recordings from previous cohorts as well. And so being able to kind of look back and see what other um, cohorts have said as well. And so that was kind of the best way that I prepped. Um, and then as well as just kind of having others uh, take a look at my application. Um, so I had, you know, my fiance, I had my roommates, friends, um, clinical instructors, um, professors, family members. I just pretty much gave it to everybody and tried to get as much constructive criticism um, back as possible. And from there, just kind of build on uh, the, app, the application just um, time and time again to eventually where, you know, I was really confident uh, prior to submitting it. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. And then we have Danielle. Danielle, can you share the same information? So introduce yourself, your specialty area, um, what cohort you're in. I think we're all at cohort 36 right now <laughs> representing um, and then have um, share what you how you prepared for the application process and what made you successful. Hey everyone, um, I'm Danielle. I work on F3, which is a medical oncology unit. 
Um, I uh, agree with both everything that the other two said. Um, similar to Ernest, I kind of tried to keep a journal throughout my clinical experiences. It wasn't structured um, the way he said his program was, but I just kind of wrote down little stories and reminders to myself. Um, and with each of those stories, it was little things like, here was the lesson, like, here's why I'm different now, similar to what um, Letty was saying they, they want on the application questions. Um, so just kind of spending that time over time reflecting. Um, and because the application, it's not open yet, right? You guys still have a little time just to start as early as possible, practicing, telling your story. Um, and I would say both in written and in speaking, um, just to help you practice for the written application as well as the spoken interview. Um, working out the nerves, working out the kinks. Um, and like uh, Ernest said to you, just getting tons of feedback from people that you trust. Um, so I agree with like the nursing instructors. I worked with a couple of my uh, like colleagues or my classmates who I went to school with and we kind of um, helped each other out, did a little exchange, highly recommend that. Um, and then what else? Yeah, I think what I feedback that I got during the interviews, um, what my managers now told me was that, I, and I think this is true across job types, but particularly in nursing, it's that they tend to hire for character and train for skill. So they know you're going to come in, you're going to learn what it takes to be a great nurse through this program. And they know that everyone's coming in fresh and new. So if you can show them baseline uh, who you are as a person, like the good qualities that you do have, your willingness to learn, your leadership, um, receptiveness to feedback, teamwork, all those things. If you can show them, like, I bring this baseline set of skills from these experiences that I have, because um, they know, right, like exactly uh, like Alejandro was saying, like not everybody is uh, running codes or doing super impressive medical things prior to this, but if you seem like a person who is ready to learn those things and, you know, take all that on, I think that's the, the most valuable advice I had. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, so we're gonna have Carly just jump back on. We're gonna clarify one of the um, items that we talked about, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience for a Q&A session. Thanks, Letty. Um, so for the February 27th date, just got clarification from Carrie Zoss, our program manager. February 27th is the day that you need to have your California license in hand, not your NCLEX cutoff date, but your California license must be in your hand February 27th. So that date will not change. There will not be exceptions made. That's just what we have to do to be able to clear everyone in time. So um, I know some of you are like, well, there's just absolutely no time, but keep in mind, we will be opening applications in April for our August cohort. So just check that on your calendar and apply. You know, we highly encourage you to apply for the next cohort and you're already prepared for that application as well. So, thanks, thanks Carly. Thank you. Okay, so now we leave this opportunity. We have about 21 minutes um, to open it up to anybody um, in the audience who would like to ask our panel here some questions. Um, we have them here available. And if the answers or the information wasn't already answered in the chat or in the presentation, we invite you. So Tenzin, I see you with your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Hi. Yes. So um, I one of the requirements you guys said was no more than six months full time experience as an RN. And are we talking about from the application start date or the start date of the program? Start date of the program. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Philip. Yeah, hi, everybody. Thank you, Leticia and Carly for hosting this. It's great to see everybody here. I had a question for the people who are in the current uh, cohort. I was wondering about your experience with the panel interviews and what do you think made you successful during those interviews? Um, I can answer it unless anyone else has. Um, uh, I think for myself in regards to uh, preparation beforehand. So um, uh, I believe Letty, right? Don't you guys do a, another Zoom session? Yeah. So attending that for sure. Um, I also looked at kind of the, one of the previous ones too from the cohort before mine. Um, and then in regards to the reflections that I was talking about from before um, that you use on your application, um, 
because you don't know what the questions are beforehand, right, for the, the interview. Um, for myself, I wrote down uh, a list of reflections um, or experiences that I had throughout nursing school, specifically in clinical, um, that really stood out to me. And I was able to utilize those experiences, um, but I would format them in multiple ways to where regardless of whatever the question was being asked, I would be able to format that experience to that question. So for instance, if you had an experience that involved um, like miscommunication, but you're able to repair that relationship, um, or for instance, able to um, help out uh, in a team working setting. So even though it's one experience, it can be utilized for multiple different questions, as well as that one experience could be used for say for instance, you're asked four questions, that one experience uh, can be used for those four questions if you want it, if it truly you know, stood out in that way for you. And then as well as obviously just tons of practice interviews, um, asking clinical instructors, professors, uh, family and friends to just interview and just for, at least for myself, I just practice nonstop. Thank you. Jillian, I see you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Sorry, I'm in Starbucks, if you can hear the music, but I was wondering for the people who are currently in the new grad program, what stands out to you? What's like been the most helpful to you as you transition as a nurse? I can take that one. Um, I found one of the things uh, that's been really helpful to me with this program um, is that our kind of mentors, um, and I've worked with Carrie during my residency, um, is that they've been really accessible. So I've like emailed Carrie and been like, hey, I could really use a phone call. Like I could, I need to debrief this shift I had. I had this experience that was really hard. Um, and she was really open to doing that with me. Um, and then just kind of seeking out, I found the culture on my unit, and I've heard this from other nurse residents as well, that the cultures on their units are um, such that they're really receptive to learning and growth. Um, so kind of seeking out nurses who, and you'll see them on the floor, people who are like one cohort above you, um, seeking them out because they're, you know, they've been in your shoes right before you. Um, yeah, so it's just really rich with resources and people who are willing to share stories, um, tell you that what you're going through is totally normal um, and process with you. Um, yeah, so take advantage of that. People are willing and excited to do that. Thank you. Diego, I see you have a question. Yeah, I do. Um, so within your cohort, do you notice that there's a majority of certain types of nursing graduates? Like I know you said that uh, ADNs, BSNs, and MSNs are accepted, but is there just a certain, uh, is there a majority among those graduates? I know our cohort, I believe there was 103 of us that started together. Um, I wanna say from what I saw talking to other people, a good majority were, you know, before I used to be, only be a son and master's students but with with now that they were taking ADN students I saw like a good good portion of the the residents were from ADM programs so there's a good mix of all types I know during my panel interview um there was like a master's student two BSN students and me and I was thinking like what am I doing here like there's no way I'm going to get into the program but you know here I am so like don't count yourself out just because you know you only have your associates you know like you know you put in the work during nursing school, so it's possible. Thank you. Van, I see you have a question. Uh, hi, yes. Um, I was just wondering, what are some unexpected challenges that you faced during your residency program or even during the interview process, like some, some unexpected challenges, just so you know, I can <laughs> just have a head start knowing ahead of time. Um, I think for every individual, um, it might be a bit different. Uh, I can't really speak for everybody on in that specific regard. I know um, for myself, uh, obviously just anxiety because you're, you know, in an interview um, and it's kind of a major interview. Uh, but I think practice in general uh, definitely helps ease anxiety. There's, I think there's a huge difference between just winging it and getting practice in. Um, for myself, practicing part of the interview definitely helped me out. Um, and then in regards to challenges um, for uh, starting the program, I mean, that's also kind of difficult to answer just because every individual is going to be slightly different. 
Um, but like Danielle said, uh, Stanford's really heavy in resources. And so if you do have any challenge, um, your preceptor, your peers, uh, your floats, your charge, um, we have crisis nurses, acute care nurses, there's just an endless supply of individuals um, that will be willing to help you out and you know kind of make sure that everything goes safely for the for you and for the patient. Um, so if there is any sort of challenge, it's usually there's a, a resource that can help you answer that challenge. Thank you. Yeah. Maven, I see you have your hand up. Did I say your name right? Uh, close. It's pronounced Marvin. Thank you. Okay. Marvin. Um, hi, I uh, give me just a second, sorry. Um, Alejandra, I really appreciate you for being here because I am a person who's pursuing this with an ADN. And I think that's one of those things that has scared me in reaching for such big goals, knowing that we're competing with just a lot of different people who are all talented in different ways. My question is, um, because I'm just entering the nursing field, I feel like I'm still figuring out what um, exact specialty and what area I want to go into. I feel confident that I can do a lot of different things. What advice do you have for people who are just starting off as nurses and having done something else in the, in the past and how to choose what we should, you know, how to prioritize these things and what to get into? Well, I know like when I went into nursing school, Lena, I was like, hopefully nursing school gives me an idea of what specialty I want to go to. You know, I really enjoy them all. So I'm so like, you know, you know I could work in any field, but um, honestly, just, you know, don't count yourself out. Just, you know, show up, you know, you put in the work during nursing school, you know stuff, even if it feels like you don't know anything, like, you know stuff, because I know when I showed up, um, and I started working with patients at Stanford, I was like, I don't know anything, but you know, you know stuff, you know stuff and it shows like, and then, you know, through the residency program, you'll work with a preceptor and you know, you'll, you jump right in, but it's not like you're taking care of like four patients and you're doing everything for them. It's like, you know, they, they ease you in. And then, so you get to see, um, you know, whatever unit you get to, you get hired in, you know, if that's something, if that's a good fit for you, then, you know, awesome that you can stay there, but there's also the option of, you know, transferring to other units if you feel like that specialty is not right for you. So just because you get hired into like a cardiology unit does not mean that you have to work there the rest of your life, you know. Stanford is really open um, to working with you and making sure that you work in a, a, a the specialty that, you know, is the right fit for you. Thank you. Okay, next question. I have uh, Kwasia. Did I say your name right? Hello, it's pronounced Kwasia. Kwasia, okay. Hi, yes. Um, thank you for sharing all this information. This has been really great. Um, my question for you is currently in my state, they allow graduate students to work without their license under the supervision of a licensed RN. Um, would that be considered as an externship experience for you guys, or would that be considered as? an actual job? Um, I'll answer that one. So you said that you have, maybe we can look at that a little bit. You can email that um, email provided, and then we can talk about that a little more detail to just, just try to help you classify what would be considered. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Susan, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to make this succinct. So um, for the like paragraph question, um, like in, in the approach to uh, patient care, can I mention how um, in my first attempt at preceptorship, there was something that happened that I did that was bad that gave me an automatic fail. But then my second attempt at preceptorship, I learned from that mistake. And then it changed my um, approach to patient care dramatically in terms of like, I was a stellar, like, Preceptive student, would that count? Yeah, so, I mean. you know, so you're, is, are you referring to the question of what question are you referring to? You made a mistake? Um, well, it, it's about the paragraph question, like uh, the telling a story. And then, so, like, you know. So there's four I, questions. I think there's one about a caring moment, um, there's one about community service, and there's one about perseverance. And I'm missing the third one, the fourth one, but as long as you answer the questions, um, 
then that would be a story you can use. You just want to make sure that you're answering the actual question that it's asking and you can relate it back to that of what you learned. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. Bernice, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So I wanted to ask the panelists, now that you've been like exposed to Stanford and been there for a while, um, in what ways are you involved at Stanford? Like, aside from being like also a bedside nurse or like how do you, or like what areas do you look like um, you would want to get involved like in the future, um, now seeing like what else there is to offer? I can jump on that unless Daniel wants to. Um, I was gonna say I know uh, for our. I'm pretty sure I don't know. Letty, other floors do it. I'm pretty sure they do, but my floor they do something called SLC. So it's the uh, Shared Leadership Council, um, and so they get together. Um, I believe it's once a month, um, and they come up with um, pretty much different practices and and uh, forgetting the the word at the moment. Letty, maybe you can help me, but um, uh, like certain things for the units where uh, it's escaped. Like different goals? Yeah, yeah, like, different, yeah, like there's certain things, like for instance. Um, are you thinking of the, the are they like quality metrics? Yes. Yeah, you have quality, yeah, yeah. you have research, um, you know, education and. Yeah, uh, I'm forgetting it. I'm, I'm not on SLC, so I can't really <laughs> speak upon it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's kind of more the, uh, the veteran nurses that are on there. Um, but that's something that I'm looking forward to eventually one day, you know, hopefully applying to, um, you know, obviously I'm still early on in my career, so it's not something that I feel comfortable with just yet because, um, every day is, is still a huge learning experience for me. And so that's something that maybe in the future I'd be interested. Um, but in, in the moment, it's not something, um, but just yesterday I had a, a check-in with Letty and. Um, they were telling us about, you know, now that we've reached our six month mark, you get a certain number of um, education hours. And so that's something that, you know, is absolutely amazing where Stanford will offer you to uh, go to conferences um, or take certain classes and they'll cover all the expenses, uh, which is absolutely amazing because it'll help you progress in your career um, instead of just focusing as a bedside nurse. So it's, it's absolutely amazing. Thank you. A little bit to that too, which is like also as you kind of grow in your role, like the the people that are in the cohort just above us have been there, I think just a little over a year now. And those people are starting to um, work, like work towards being float nurses or resource nurses. So roles with a little bit more like leadership on the floor. Um, so as you kind of grow in your practice and get more confident, there's always like a new, a new challenge, I would say, a new place that you can kind of grow into as you're ready. Um, and like in oncology specifically, in a couple more months, we'll start getting chemo certified. So just different skills that might be specific to your department too. Thanks guys. <clears throat> Rebecca, I see your hand up. You dropped down. I'm glad that you popped back up with your question. Um, uh, oh, different. Oh, different Rebecca. Rebecca Citarella. Yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering um, based off of the people that are in the program right now like what are some things you like to, to do on your free time because it sounds like it's very um time consuming like there's a lot of things going on with that like what do you like to do to like fill your own cups and like do things outside of the hospital so definitely when you start um I know like some people have the tent, they want to, you know, be really well prepared while they're at work. So, you know, they advise, they advise against like, when you're at home on your days off, don't look up any nursing stuff, you know, make sure that your time off is actually time off because, you know, you only work three days a week, but it's very, you come home very tired, especially, you know, I work night shift. And so on the, my days off, you know, the first day off, you know, I mainly spend it sleeping. But other than that, you know, I like to go out, hang out with friends, try to be as social as possible. Um, because, you know, once, you know, you want to fill up your cup with like, you know, things that make you happy, because sometimes work can be really stressful. Like, you know, you can have a really tough shift where like, you know, you might lose a patient, or, you know, something unexpected might happen. So you want to make sure that, 
you know, you come, you know, you're taking care of your like mental well-being, um, that, you know, you're hanging out with people who, you know, support you, you know, hang out with your friends, your family, you know, go on walks with your pets, you know, like do things that make you happy because, you know, you want to show up to work, ready to work, but you also want to make sure that, you know, you're not burning out, you know, so. Thank you. I would say to add on to all that, just, um, to kind of piggyback off her, uh, you do like, a, was it the NRP, the nurse residency program uh, seminars every month. And so uh, everybody like Letty, Chrissy, um, Carrie, like they all stress on self-care, which is awesome. Um, Cause you know, initially you think like, oh, I should just be going home and researching all this or looking up different meds, but they really stress about self-care. Um, which is absolutely awesome. And a lot of the units, like you get together for like picnics or just hang out. Um, if you work nights, uh, sometimes you get brunch. If you guys like all work the weekend, then Sunday, you know, you all get brunch together. So it's pretty cool. All right. Thank you. So we have three minutes left. We're going to go to Vanessa and hopefully we can go to the next question. Vanessa, do you have a question? Yes. Hello. Um, this is more so, I guess, once you're in the program. Um, for like residents who are struggling to understand or conduct certain hands-off skills that they may have not experienced as much throughout their nursing school experience, does the program have extra resources for those residents who just need extra time? Just because at least for me personally, I started uh, once um, COVID started. And so we had those that limitation on top of like the hospital's um, limitations. So just wondering um, what kind of resources the program provide, if any. I'll answer that one, guys. So what we did when we realized um, or when we recognized that a lot of the hours for clinical time was decreased because of COVID initially, um, we added some time to the program on orientation. So the orientation used to be a little bit shorter. So we were able to add some extra orientation hours to um, supplement that. We also added some more unit educator time. Um, every unit has an educator that um, it, on boards and orients the nurse residents when they're first um, coming into the program. Um, but we added two more sessions so that way they can go over things to really just solidify and give you a little bit more exposure. Um, but again, right, our program, we don't, um, we application based, so we wanna teach you all the skills. So we just kind of meet you where you're at and then grow from there. So if there's ever a need where it's really needed to go one-on-one, -on -one, um, that's where our program, myself, Christy and Carrie will, or the nursing professional development specialist who follows you, um, will step in and we'll try to help supplement anything that might be needed. All right, we have one more time for one more question. Rebecca, you got in. Hi there, thank you. Um, I had a logistical question. In terms of if we're applying uh, and it starts in October, and let's say we make it through all the way up till February, but logistically we don't have the RN license in hand, how is that going to affect our application if we have to withdraw it and apply for the next cohort? So you're saying you may not have your application by that cutoff date. You might not have your California license by the cutoff date. By the 27th, yes. Yeah, then you can you can just reapply. You can withdraw. I mean, that would probably be the best thing because that way you don't leave it in the queue. Um, and then you can just apply the next time. That would, We don't have a limit of how many times you can apply. We do have the time limit, though. So 18 months, uh, your transcript date before the start of the cohort date is the only thing you need to be mindful of as far as um, time and things like that. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, oh, exactly, it's 12.30, so that is time. Um, I see a few other people. Naomi, if you have a question, you could definitely email our team, um, go to our page, the Nurse Residency Program for Stanford Healthcare, and we have an email there that you can um, ask any additional questions. But I think, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Christy and Carly for coming on to the webinar. Thank you so much. And a special thank you to our nurse residents. I know you guys add a lot and I, I feel like it's uh, people here really appreciate you guys coming on and sharing your experience um, and being an inspiration for the people that are trying to apply. If anybody has any additional questions, you can find our information on our site and we can um, wish you the best of luck in the application process and we hope to see you soon. Leticia, you mentioned there's another video that'll come on at some point. Is that, do we just check the website for that? Yeah, you check the adver You check the website and then we'll advertise for the interview prep. Thank you. Thanks.